Hey there students, how's it going? Um, so today let's try our first full tale and this is going to be from the Norse Myths by Kevin Crossley Holland. Uh, the story today is called The Mead of Poetry and without further ado I will begin. When the Aesir and the Vanir had made a truce and settled terms for a lasting peace, every single god and goddess spat into a great jar. This put the seal on their friendship, and because the Aesir were so anxious that no one should forget it, even for one moment, they carried off the jar and out of the spittle they fashioned a man. His name was Vasir. He was so steeped in all manners and mysteries of the nine worlds since fire and ice first met in Ganungagap, that no god, nor man, nor giant, nor dwarf, ever regretted putting him a question or asking his opinion, and wherever Vasir went, news of his coming went before him. When he reached some remote farm or hamlet, sowing and salting and scything and swordplay were laid aside. Even children stopped chattering and listened to his words. What was his secret? It was as much in his manner as in his mind of understanding. Question of fact he answered with simple facts. But to ask Vizier for his opinion, what shall I say? What do you think? What shall I do? Did not always mean getting a direct answer. Sitting back in his ill-fitting clothes, as often as not with his eyes closed, he would listen to recitals of problems and sorrows with a kind, grave, blank face. He took in and set everything in a wider frame. He never intruded or insisted. Rather, he suggested. Often enough, he answered a question with another question. He made gods and men. Giants and dwarves feel that they had been helped to answer their own questions. The stories of Vasir's wisdom soon reached the ears of a most unpleasant pair of brothers, the dwarves, Fjaller and Galler. Their interests soon turned to envy, and their envy to energy, for they could not admire anything without wanting it for themselves. They asked Vasir to feast with them, and a large gathering of dwarves in their cave under the earth, and, as was his custom, Vasir accepted. The table was a long slab of uneven rock. The floor was grit, and the wall hangings were dripping stalactites. The talk was chiefly of profit and loss and petty revenge. The food, however, and the tableware, all made of hammered gold, were rather more pleasing. After the feast, Fjaller and Galler asked Vasir for a word in private. Vasir followed them into a gloomy chamber, and that was a mistake. The two dwarves had knives hidden in their sleeves, and at once they buried them in this wise man's chest. His blood spurted out of his body, and Fjaller and Galler caught it all in two large jars. Son and Bone, and a cauldron called Odrorer, Vasir's heart stopped pumping, and his drained white body lay still on the ground. When after a while the Aesir sent a messenger to ask after Vasir, the two dwarves sent back word that he had unfortunately choked on his own learning, because there was no one in the nine worlds well informed enough to compare and compete with him. But Fjaller and Galler were delighted with what they had done. They poured honey into the jars and cauldron, and filled with Vasir's blood, and with ladies' ladles, stirred the mixture. The blood and honey formed a sublime mead. Whoever drank it became a poet or a wise man. The dwarves kept this mead to themselves. No one else tasted it. No one even heard about it. One day the dwarf brothers entertained two gruesome guests. The giant, Gilling, and his wife. It was not long before they began to quarrel, and Fjaller and Galler became more and more spiteful and full of hate. They suggested that Gilling might enjoy the sea breeze, and each taking an oar, rowed far out in the ocean surrounding Midgard. Then the dwarves rammed their boat into a slimy, half-submerged rock. Gilling was alarmed and gripped one gunwale. 
His arm, his alarm, was well founded. The boat floundered and capsized. Gilling was unable to swim, and that was the end of Gilling. The two dwarves cheerfully righted their craft and rowed back home, singing. Fjaller and Gollard described what had happened to Gilling's wife. An accident, said Fjaller. If only he had been able to swim, Gollard said sadly. Gilling's wife wept and wept, and sitting in their cave, the two dwarves did not like the feel of the tepid water washing round their ankles. I've an idea, whispered Fjaller to his brother. Find a millstone, and go and wait above the entrance to the cave. Gollar got up and went outside, and Fjaller asked the giant test. Would it help if you looked out to sea? I could show you the place where he drowned. Gilling's wife stood up, sobbing, and Fjaller stepped aside for her as befits a host. And when the giantess stepped out into the daylight, Gollar dropped the millstone onto her head. I was sick of her wailing, said Fjaller. When Gilling and his wife did not return to Jotunheim, their son, Sutung, set out in search of them. He looked at the dwarves' dismal faces and listened to their lengthy tales, and then he seized both of them by the scruffs of their neck. Holding one in each hand, a pair of danglers, he angrily waded a mile out to sea until it was too deep even for him. Then Satung dumped Fjaller and Gollar on a skerry, a sopping rock standing just clear of the water. It's much too far for you to swim, he said, much too far. So when the tide rises, Fjaller looked at Gollar, and both brothers grimaced. We've a suggestion, said Fjaller. Since it has come to this, said Gollar, we're willing to offer you our greatest treasure. Then Fjaller described their mead, both its origin and power, with a wealth of words. Give us our lives, said Gollar, and we'll give it to you. Agreed, said Satung. So Satung took the two dwarves back to their cave, and, since they clearly had no choice, they handed over Vasir's blood. The giant stumped back to Jotunheim, carrying San in one hand and Bodin in the other, and a drawer under his arm. He took the precious liquid straight to the mountain of Hnitbjorb, where he lived. Satung hewed a new chamber out of the rock, at the heart of the mountain, and hid three crocs in it, and he told his daughter, Gunlod, that she had one duty. Guard this mead by day, and guard this mead by night. Unlike the dwarf brothers, Satung was boastful about his treasure, so it was not long before the gods learned about the divine mead, and heard how it had fallen into Satung's unholy hands. Odin himself elected to go to Jotunheim, and bring the mead back to Asgard. The masked god, the one-eyed god, god of gods, disguised himself as a giant of a man, and called himself Bulver, worker of evil. He crossed the river that divided Asgard and Jotunheim, and strode across a desert of shifting gray grit, where nothing, not even a grass blade, could take root. Bulver came to a curtain of mountains, he hurried over a snowy pass and at last walked down into a narrow green valley. Nine thralls were working in a slopping field, men from Midgard, with a taste for adventure and handsome reward. They were scything the succulent grass with long, slow sweeps and seemed very weary. Who is your master? Bulwark asked one thrall who had stopped work entirely. Baugi, said one thrall. Baugi? Satung's brother, the thrall said, the giant who guards Vasir's blood. Shall I sharpen your scythe? asked Bulwark affably. The thrall was rather quick to agree to this, but when Bulwark drew a whetstone from his belt and began to put a new edge on the scythe, the other thralls crowded round in the hope he would hone their scythes too. Bulwark obliged, and the thralls all said that their scythes had never been quite as sharp before. They complained that the giant Baugi was 
too hard a taskmaster. They pointed to acres of grass, still uncut, that lay before them. Coming to the point, the thralls asked whether they could buy the hone. I might think about selling it, said Bulberg, but only to a man, and only to the one. If there is such a man here, who will feast me tonight in the manner to which I am accustomed. The air was filled with the shouts of agreement. Yes, the thralls shouted. Yes, me, I will, here, all right. I'm your man, done, agreed. Your hand on it. Bulwark looked at them with his one eye. He smiled grimly. Then he threw the whetstone into the air. In the sun it glinted. It looked like silver. The thralls gasped. They raised their sides and ran, all of them eager to be under the whetstone when it fell. It seemed to hang in the air. So high had Bulwark tossed it. The thralls jostled. They stepped backwards. They suddenly swung around, and in the end, in their confusion, they all slit one another's throats. The nine of them lay in the long grass they had just cut. Still smiling grimly, Bulwark caught the whetstone, tucked it into his belt, and walked back the way he had came. The sun dawdled, and so did all father. Not until nearly midnight did he come down from the mountains again, and make his way to Bogie's farm. He said his name was Bulwark, and explained that he had been walking all day. Then he asked Bogie if he could give him some kind of meal, and let him stay overnight in one of the huge barns near to the farmhouse. A fine time to ask, said Baugi abruptly. Bulwark looked pain and asked Baugi what was wrong. All my farmhands have been killed. That is what's wrong. Baugi banged his fist on a trestle table, a blow so powerful it would have flattened a man's head. All nine of them, and how can I hope to find any more at this time of year? I've an idea, said Bulwark. You can see I am strong, very strong. I can take on the work of nine men. Baugi looked Bulwark up and down, and smiled in disbelief, thinking Bulwark was a hollow boaster. And if I agreed, what wages would you ask? Only this, said Bulwark, one drink of Satung's mead. Baugi sniffed and shook his head. I may be strong, said Belverk, but to be a poet, that's the finest calling. That mead is nothing to do with me, said Belgi. My brother has it in his safe keeping, and no one except Gunlod has ever seen a drop of it. That's how things are. Well, said Belverk, those are my terms. Belgi shrugged his shoulders, and so Belverk got up to leave. I can talk to Satung, said Baugi. He had little love for his brother, but he felt sure that in any case, Bulwark would never be strong enough to keep his part of the bargain. Work for me this summer, and I'll tell my brother how you helped me out. That's the best I can do. How far can I trust you? said Bulwark. You'll see, said Baugi. For as long as the long days, Belverk worked for Bogi. As the sun climbed out of the east, Belverk walked to the green field, still thick with the honeydew that fell every night from the branches of Yggdrasil. All day he worked under the bright skull of the sky. He worked while the sun hurried west until it seemed to hang, blood red on the western skyline. Baugi was amazed that Belverk was as good as his boast, and seemed to need so little rest he thought now that Belverk must be more than merely human. At the end of the summer, Belverk asked Baugi for his wages. They went together to find Satung at Nietbjörg, and Baugi told his brother how Belverk had helped him and asked for some of the divine mead. Never, said Satung, not a drop. Well, said Belverk, as soon as he was alone with Baugi, I hope you're not going to accept Satung's answer. I've worked for you all summer. I've kept my promise, Baugi said. Why should he have it all for himself, said Belverk. Don't you fancy a mouthful, Baugi? Since your brother won't pay, 
won't part with the mead willingly. Let us see if we can trick him out of it. Impossible, said Valgi. Do you know where it is hidden? He was rather nervous of Satung, but he was also rather nervous of Bulverk. Bulverk pulled an auger called Rati out of his belt and told the giant that with it he might be able to drill a hole through the mountain. This is the least you can do in return for my work. Baugi took the auger and pressed the shank against the sheer rock face of the mountain Yitblorg. With both hands, he turned the handle. He wondered how to get rid of the troublesome farmhand as he wound and wound and the auger sank into the mountain. There, exclaimed the giant, right through. He withdrew the drill and wiped his brow. Boverk peered with his one eye into the dark passage left by the auger. Then he filled his lungs and blew fiercely into it. A shower of rock chippings blew back into his face, and Boverk knew that Baugi had not, after all, cored the mountain. Were you trying to cheat me? he said. The giant said nothing. He drilled further into the mountain, vowing silently to dispose of Bulverk as soon as he could. When Baugi withdrew the auger once more, and Bulverk blew down the hole a second time, all the loose chippings were carried forward on the tide of air. Then Bulverk knew the giant had bored right into the room at the heart of Nitbjorg. At once he turned himself into a snake and shrithed into the auger hole. Bogey stabbed at Bulverk with the point of his auger, but he was not quick enough. The snake was already halfway down the passage, on his way to Gunlod and the Divine Mead. As soon as he reached the stronghold, Bulverk changed himself back into a giant of a man, one-eyed but handsome, and stood in front of Satung's daughter. Gunlod was sitting on a stool of solid gold, and at the sight of Bulverk, Satung's stern warning that she should guard the mead flew right out of her head. She was not sorry to have company. She sat and listened to Bulverk's beguiling words and songs. She wrapped her arms around him. For three days they talked and laughed, and for three nights they slept together. In the silent cave under Nipborg, the heartless father of the gods made love to the spellbound daughter of Satung. Then Gunlod was drunk with passion and ready to give Bulverk whatever he desired. He asked for three draughts of Vasir's blood, and Gunlod took his hand and led him to the meat. With his first drought, Bulverk emptied a drawer. With his second drought, Bodin. And with his third drought, Sun. The father of the gods held all the divine mead in his mouth. Then Odin turned himself into an eagle, flapped down the passage out of Nipbjorg, and headed for Asgard. Satung saw him, and at once murmured the magic words known only to those who have drunk divine mead. Gods and giants, and men and dwarves, saw a dark sight, one eagle pursuing another towards the kingdom of Asgard. The Aesir quickly brought out jars and bowls and laid them side by side, so that they covered the whole courtyard, just inside the Great Wall of Asgard. Anxiously, they watched as Satung came closer and closer to Odin. The distant rustle became a whir, and the whir a terrible flapping and beating of wings. There was only a wingspan between the two birds. Then the eagle Odin dived in over the wall and spat the mead into the rocks, into the crocks assembled beneath him. In his haste to escape Satung, Odin could not help letting some mead spill outside the wall, but it was so little that the gods were not bothered about it. They said that anyone who wanted it could have it, and that became the poet taster's portion. Satung shrieked and wheeled away and shrieked again, he had lost through cunning what he had won through force, and there was nothing he could do. And the gods? They had lost wise Kvasir, witness to the friendship between the Aesir and the Vanir. But because of the cunning of the Allfather, they had won back his blood. Once more, Odin drank some of the precious mead, and from time to time he offered a drought to one of the Aesir, or to a man or two in Midgard, 
he offered them the gift of poetry. So that was the tale of the Mead of Poetry. And kind of what I'm getting about this, getting from this, is um, poetry, song, literature, all that stuff is a gift. And it's not really something that, it's not a gift that's shared by everyone. Uh, so at the base minimum in this story, it's kind of an explanation that they... Uh, Nordic peoples came up with to justify why some people are so good at poetry and that craft and why some aren't. It's because they were shared from Odin the gift of this mead. Uh, that's my interpretation at least. Uh, the story is over. If you want to click off now, go ahead. I'm going to read now from the back an excerpt uh, briefly on the notes uh, from this story, the Meta Poetry. The remark attributed to George I, I hate all poets and painters, is ludicrous, not only for its content, but also for its failure to master the language to express that content. In the beginning was the word, and primitive societies venerated poets second only to their leaders. A poet had the power to name and so to control. He was literally the living memory of a group or tribe who would perpetuate their history and song. His inspiration was God-given, and he was, in effect, a medium. So what that's talking about is the oral tradition. So before words, before writing, before pictures, hieroglyphics, there was the oral tradition. And even after writing before it was so commonplace in our societies, stories would be shared from one person to another orally. And that in those stories was the only collection of history that these people had, regardless of how embellished those stories were. Um, that is how society was kept, was through this oral tradition. Um, so these people who recalled and recanted those stories were very highly respected in society all right that's all i got for you guys hopefully we can do another one of these quite soon and i will share that link with y'all all right students stay happy stay healthy and i wish you all the best Bye bye